Part Seven of The Wheels of Chance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wheels of Chance by H. G. Wells. Chapter Twenty, The Pursuit. And now to tell of Mister Hoopdriver rising with the sun, vigilant, active, wonderful, the practical half of the lead-framed window stuck open, ears alert, an eye flickering incessantly in the corner panes, in oblique glances at the angelic front. Miss Wardour wanted him to have his breakfast downstairs in her kitchen, but that would have meant abandoning the watch, and he held out strongly. The bicycle, cap a pie, occupied, under protest, a strategic position in the shop, he was expectant by six in the morning. By nine, horrible fears oppressed him that his quest had escaped him, and he had to reconnoitre the angel yard in order to satisfy himself. There he found the ostler, brushing down the bicycles of the chase, and he returned, relieved, to Mrs. Wardour's premise. And about ten they emerged, and rode quietly up the north street. He watched them until they turned the corner of the post office, and then out onto the road and up after them in fine style. They went by the engine house where the old stocks and the whipping posts are, and on to the Chichester Road, and he followed gallantly. So this great chase began. They did not look round, and he kept them just within sight, getting down if he chanced to draw closer upon them round a corner. By riding vigorously, he kept quite conveniently near them for they made but little hurry. He grew hot indeed, and his knees were a little stiff to begin with, but that was all. There was little danger of losing them, for a thin chalky dust lay upon the road, and the track of her tire was milled like a shilling, and his was a checkered ribbon along the way. So they rode by Cobden's monument and through the prettiest of villages, until at last the downs rose steeply ahead. There they stopped a while at the only inn in the place, and Mr. Hoopdriver took up a position which commanded the inn door and mopped his face and thirsted and smoked red herring cigarette. They remained in the inn for some time. A number of chubby innocents returning home from school stopped and formed a line in front of him and watched him quietly but firmly for the space of ten minutes or so. "'Go away!' said he, and they only seemed quietly interested." He asked them all their names, and they answered indistinct murmurs. He gave it up at last, and became passive on his gait, and so at length they tired of him. The couple under observation occupied the inn so long that Mr. Hoopdriver, at the thought of their possible employment, hungered as well as he thirsted. Clearly they were lunching. It was a cloudless day, and the sun at the meridian beat down upon the top of Mr. Hoopdriver's head, a shower bath of sunshine, a huge jet of hot light. It made his head swim. At last they emerged, and the other man in brown looked back and saw him. They rode on to the foot of the down, and dismounting, began to push tediously up that long, nearly vertical ascent of blinding white road. Mr. Hoopdriver hesitated. It might take them twenty minutes to mount that. Beyond was an empty downland, perhaps for miles, he decided to return to the inn and snatch a hasty meal. At the inn they gave him biscuits and cheese and a misleading pewter measure of sturdy ale, pleasant under the palate, cool in the throat, but leaden in the legs of a hot afternoon. He felt a man of substance as he emerged in the blinding sunlight, but even by the foot of the down the sun was insisting again that his skull was too small for his brains. The hill had gone steeper, the chalky road blazed like magnesium light, and his front wheel began an apparent incurable squeaking. He felt as a man from Mars would feel if he were suddenly transferred to this planet about three times as heavy as he wanted to feel. The two black figures had vanished over the forehead of the hill. "'The tracks'll be all right,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. That was a comforting reflection." It not only justified a slow progress up the hill, but at the crest a sprawl on the turf beside the road to contemplate the weald from the south. In a matter of two days he had crossed that spacious valley with its frozen surge of green hills, its little villages and townships here and there, its copses and cornfields, its ponds and streams, like jewellery of diamonds and silver glittering in the sun. 
The North Downs were hidden far away beyond the Weldon Heights. Down below the little village of Cocking, and halfway up the hill, a mile perhaps to the right, hung a flock of sheep grazing together. Overhead an anxious pewit circled against the blue, and every now and then emitted its feeble cry. Up here the heat was tempered by a pleasant breeze. Mr. Hoopdriver was possessed by an unreasonable contentment. He lit himself a cigarette and lounged more comfortably. Surely the Sussex ale is made of the waters of lathe and of poppies and pleasant dreams. Drowsiness coiled insidiously about him. He awoke with a guilty start to find himself sprawling prone to the turf with his calf over one eye. He sat up, rubbed his eyes, and realized that he had slept. His head was still a trifle heavy. And the chase? He jumped to his feet and stooped to pick up his overturned machine. He whipped out his watch and saw that it was past two o'clock. Lord love us, fancy that! But the tracks'll be all right, said Mr. Hoopdriver, wheeling his machine back to the chalky road. I must scorch till I overtake them. He mounted and rode as rapidly as the heat and a lingering lassitude permitted. Now and then he had to dismount to examine the surface where the road forked. He enjoyed that, rather. Track him, he said out loud, and decided, in the privacy of his own mind, that he had a wonderful instinct for spore. So he came past Goodwood Station and Lavent, and approached Chichester towards four o'clock, and then came a terrible thing. In places the road became hard, in places where the crowded indentations of a recent flock of sheep and at last in the throat of the town cobbles and the stony streets branching east west north and south at the stone cross under the shadow of the cathedral the tracks vanished oh crikey said mr hoopdriver dismounting in dismay and standing agape dropped anything said an inhabitant at the curb yes said mr hoopdriver i've lost the spoor and walked upon his way leaving the inhabitant marvelling what part of a bicycle a spoor might be mr hoopdriver abandoning tracking began asking people if they had seen a young lady in grey on a bicycle six casual people hadn't and he began to feel the inquiry was conspicuous and desisted but what was to be done hoopdriver was hot tired and hungry and full of the first gnawings of a monstrous remorse he decided to get himself some tea and meat, and in the Royal George he meditated over the business in a melancholy frame enough. They had passed out of his world, vanished, and all his wonderful dreams of some vague, crucial interference collapsed like a castle of cards. What a fool he had been not to stick to them like a leech, he might have thought. But there, what was the good of that sort of thing now? He thought of her tears, of her helplessness, of the bearing of the other man in brown, and his wrath and disappointment surging higher. "'What can I do?' said Mr. Hoopdriver aloud, bringing his fist down beside the teapot. "'What would Sherlock Holmes have done? Perhaps, after all, there might be such things as clues in the world, albeit the age of miracles was past. But to look for a clue in this intricate network of cobbled streets, to examine every muddy interstice, there was a chance by looking about and inquiry at various inns. Upon that he began, but of course they might have ridden straight through, and scarcely a soul have marked them.' and then came a positively brilliant idea. "'How many ways are there out of Chichester?' said Mr. Hoopdriver. It was really equal to Sherlock Holmes, that. "'If they've made tracks, I shall find those tracks. If not, they're in the town.' He was then in the East Street, and he started at once to make the, the circuit of the place, discovering, incidentally, that Chichester is a walled city. In passing, he made inquiries at the Black Swan, the Crown, and the Red Lion Hotel. At six o'clock in the evening he was walking downcast, intent, as one who had dropped money, along the road towards Bognor, kicking up the dust with his shoes and fretting with disappointed pugnancy. A thwarted, crestfallen hoopdriver it was, as you may well imagine. And then, suddenly, there jumped upon his attention a broad line, ribbed like a shilling, and close beside it one checkered, that even again split into two. "'Found,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, and swung round on his heel at once and back to the Royal George, helter-skelter, for the bicycle they were minding for him. The ostler thought he was confoundedly imperious, considering his machine. CHAPTER Twenty One, AT BOGNOR That seductive gentleman, Bechamel, had been working up to a crisis. 
he had started upon this elopement in a vein of fine romance immensely proud of his wickedness and really as much in love as an artificial oversoul can be with jessie but either she was the profoundest of coquettes or she had not the slightest element of passion with a large p in her composition it warred with all his ideas of himself and the feminine mind to think that under their flattering circumstances she really could be so vitally deficient he found her persistent coolness, her more or less evident contempt for himself, exasperating in the highest degree. He put it to himself that she was enough to provoke a saint, and tried to think that was piquant and enjoyable. But the blisters on his vanity asserted themselves. The fact is, he was under this standing irritation, getting down to the natural man in himself for once, and the natural man in himself, in spite of Oxford and Junior Reviewers Club, was a Paleolithic creature of simple tastes and violent methods. I'll be level with you yet, ran like a plough through the soil of his thoughts. Then, this infernal detective, Beckmel had told his wife he was going to Davos to see Carter. To that he had fancied she was reconciled, but how she would take this exploit was entirely problematic. She was a woman of peculiar moral views, and she measured marital infidelity largely by its proximity to herself. Out of her sight, and more particularly, out of the sight of the other woman of her sect, vice of the recognized description was, perhaps, permissible to those contemptible weaklings, men, but this was evil on high roads. She was bound to make a fuss, and these fusses invariably took the final form of a tightness of money for Beckmel, albeit, and he felt it was heroic of him to resolve so, it was worth doing if it was to be done. His imagination worked on a kind of matronly valkyrie, and the noise of pursuit and vengeance was in the air. The idol still had the front of the stage. That accursed detective, it seemed, had been thrown off the scent, and that, at any rate, gave a night's respite. But things must be brought to an issue forthwith. By eight o'clock in the evening, in a little dining room in the Vicuana Hotel, Bognor, the crisis had come, and Jessie, flushed and angry in the face, and with her heart sinking, faced him again for her last struggle with him. He had tricked her this time, effectually, and luck had been on his side. She was booked as Mrs. Beaumont, save for her refusal to enter their room, and her eccentricity of eating with unwashed hands she had so far kept up with the appearances of things before the waiter. But the dinner was grim enough. Now, in turn, she appealed to his better nature, and made extravagant statements of her plans to fool him. He was white and vicious by this time, and his anger quivered through his pose of brilliant wickedness. "'I will go to the station,' she said. "'I will go back.' "'The last train for anywhere leaves at 742. "'I will appeal to the police.' "'You don't know them.' "'I will tell these hotel people.' They will turn you out of the doors. You're in such a thoroughly false position now. They don't understand. Unconventionality down here. She stamped her foot. If I wander about the streets all night, she said, you who have never been out alone after dusk, do you know what the streets of a charming little holiday resort are like? I don't care, she said. I can go to the clergyman here. He's a charming man, unmarried, and men are really more alike than you think. And anyhow, well... How can you explain the last two nights to anyone now? The mischief is done, Jessie. You cur... She said, and suddenly put her hand to her breast. He thought she meant to faint. But she stood, with the color gone from her face. No, he said. I love you. Love? She said. Yes, love. There are ways yet, she said, after a pause. Not for you. You are too full of life and hope yet for... What is it? not the dark arch nor the black flowing river don't you think of it you'll only shirk it when the moment comes and turn it all into comedy she turned round abruptly from him and stood looking out across the parade at the shining sea over which the afterglow of day fled before the rising moon he maintained his attitude the blinds were still up for she had told the waiter not to draw them there was silence for some moments at last he spoke in as persuasive a voice as he could summon. Take it sensibly, Jessie. Why should we, who have so much in common, quarrel into melodrama? I swear I love you. You are all that is bright and desirable to me. I am stronger than you, older, 
man to your woman, to find you to conventional. She looked at him over her shoulder, and he noticed what, with a twinge of delight how her little chin came out beneath the curve of her cheek. Man, she said, man to my woman. Do men lie? Would a man use his five and thirty years' experience to outwit a girl of seventeen? Man to my woman, indeed, that surely is the last insult. Your repartee is admirable, Jessie. I should say they do, though. All that, and more, also when their hearts were set on such a girl as yourself. Why should you be so difficult to me? Here am I, with my reputation, my career, at your feet. Look here, Jessie, on my honour, I will marry you. God forbid, she said, so promptly that she never learnt he had a wife, even then. It occurred to him, then, for the first time, in the flash of her retort, that she did not know he was married. "'Tis only a prenuptial settlement,' he said, following that hint. He paused. "'You must be sensible. The things you're doing. Come out on the beach now. The beach here is splendid, and the moon soon will be high.' "'I won't,' she said, stamping her foot. "'Well, well.' "'Oh, leave me alone. Let me think.' "'Think,' he said, "'if you want to. It's your cry, always. But you can't save yourself by thinking, my dear girl. You can't save yourself in any way now.' If saving it is, this is Paris money. Oh, go, go. Very well, I will go. I will go and smoke a cigar and think of you, dear. But do you think I should do all this if I did not care? Go, she whispered without glancing round. She continued to stare out of the window. He stood looking at her for a moment with strange light in his eyes. He made a step towards her. I have you, he said. You were mine, nettled, caught, but mine. He would have gone up to her and laid his hand upon her, but he did not dare to do that yet. I have you in my hand, he said, in my power. Do you hear? Power. She remained impassive. He stared at her for half a minute, and then, with a superb gesture that was lost upon her, went to the door. Surely the instinctive abasement of her sex before strength was upon his side. He told himself the battle was won. She heard the handle move, and the catch click as the door closed behind him. CHAPTER Twenty Two. And now, without, in the twilight, behold Mr. Hoopdriver, his cheeks hot, his eye bright, his brain is in a tumult, the nervous, obsequious Hoopdriver, to whom I introduced you some days since, has undergone a wonderful change. Ever since he had lost that spore in Chichester, he had been tormented by the most horrible visions of the shameful insults that may be happening. The strangeness of new surrounding has been working to strip off the habitual servile from him. Here was moonlight rising over the memory of a red sunset, dark shadows, and glowing orange lamps, beauty somewhere mysteriously wrapped away from him, tangible wrong in a brown suit, and an unpleasant face floating him. Mr. Hoopdriver, for the time, was in the world of romance and a knight errantry, divinely forgetful of his social position, or hers, forgetting, too, for the time, any of the wretched timidities that had tied him long since behind the counter of his proper place. He was angry and adventurous. It was all about him, this vivid drama he had fallen into, and it was eluding him. He was far too grimly in earnest to pick up that lost thread and make a play of it now. The man was living. He did not pose when he alighted at the coffee tavern, even, nor when he made his hasty meal. As Becmel crossed from the Vicuan towards the Esplanade, Hoopdriver, disappointed and exasperated, came hurrying round the corner from the Temperance Hotel. At the sight of Becmel, his heart jumped, and the tension of his angry suspense exploded into, rather than gave place to, an excited activity of mind. They were at the Vicuna, and she was there now, alone. It was the occasion he sought, but he would give chance no chance against him. He went back round the corner, sat down on the seat, and watched Beckmill recede into the dimness up the esplanade before he got up and walked into the hotel entrance. "'A lady cyclist in grey,' he asked for, and followed boldly on the waiter's heels. The door of the dining-room was opening before he felt qualm, and then, suddenly, he was nearly minded to turn and run for it, and his features seemed to him to be convulsed. She turned with a start, and looked at him with something between terror and hope in her eyes. "'Can I have a few words with you, alone?' said Mr. Hoopdriver, controlling his breath with difficulty. She hesitated, then motioned the waiter to withdraw. 
Mr. Hoopdriver watched the door shut. He had intended to step out into the middle of the room, fold his arms, and say, You are in trouble. I am a friend. Trust me. Instead of which he stood panting, and then spoke with sudden familiarity, hastily, guiltily. Look here. I don't know what the juice is up, but I think there's something wrong. Excuse my intruding. If it isn't so, I'll do anything you like to help you out of the scrape you're in. That's my meaning, I believe. What can I do? I would do anything to help you. Her brow puckered as she watched him make with infinite emotion this remarkable speech. You, she said. She was tumultuously weighing the possibilities in her mind, and he had scarcely ceased when she had made her resolve. She stepped a pace forward. You are a gentleman, she said. Yes, said Mr. Hoopdriver. Can I trust you? She did not wait for his assurance. I must leave this hotel at once. Come here. She took his arm and led him to the window. You can just see the gate. It is still open. Through that are our bicycles. Go down, get them out, and I will come down to you. Dare you? Get out the bicycles into the road? Both. Mine alone is no good. At once. Dare you? Which way? Go out by the front door and round. I will follow in one minute. Right, said Mr. Hoopdriver, and went. He had to get those bicycles. Had he been told to go out and kill Bechamel, he would have done it. His head was a maelstrom now. He walked out of the hotel, along the front, and into the big, black-shadowed coachyard. He looked round. There were no bicycles visible. Then a man emerged from the dark, a short man in a short black shiny jacket. Hoopdriver was caught. He made no attempt to turn and run for it. "'I've been giving your machines a wipe-over, sir,' said the man, recognizing the suit and touching his cap. Hoopdriver's intelligence now was a soaring eagle. He swooped on the situation at once. "'That's right,' he said, and added, before the pause became marked. "'Where is mine? I want to look at the chain.' The man led him into an open shed and went fumbling for a lantern. Hoopdriver moved the lady's machine out of his way to the door, and then laid hands on the man's machine and wheeled it out of the shed into the yard. The gate stood open, and beyond was the pale road and a clump of trees back in the twilight. He stooped and examined the chain with trembling fingers. How was it to be done? Something behind the gate seemed to flutter. The man must be got rid of anyhow. I say, said Hoopdriver with an inspiration, can you get me a screwdriver? The man simply walked across the shed, opened and shut a box, and came up to the kneeling Hoopdriver with a screwdriver in his hand. Hoopdriver felt himself a lost man. He took the screwdriver with a rapid, thanks, and incontinentally had another inspiration. I say, he said again, well, this is miles too big. The man lit the lantern, brought it up to Mr. Hoopdriver, and put it down on the ground. "'Want a smaller screwdriver?' he said. Hoopdriver had his handkerchief out and sneezed promptly. "'Achoo! It is the orthodox thing you, when you wish to avoid recognition.' "'As small as you have,' he said, out of his pocket handkerchief. "'I ain't got none smaller than that,' said the ostler. "'Won't do, really,' said Hoopdriver, still wallowing in his handkerchief. "'I'll see what they got in the house, if you like, sir,' said the man. "'If you would,' said Hoopdriver. And as the man's heavily nailed boots went clattering down the yard, Hoopdriver stood up, took a noiseless step to the lady's machine, laid trembling hands on its handle and saddle, and prepared for a rush. The scullery door opened momentarily and sent a beam of warm yellow light up the road, shut be again behind the man, and forthwith Hoopdriver rushed the machines toward the gate. A dark grey form came fluttering to meet him. "'Give me this,' she said, "'and bring yours!' He passed the thing to her, touched her hand in the darkness, ran back, seized Beckmel's machine, and followed. The yellow light of the scullery door suddenly flashed upon the cobbles again. It was too late now to do anything but escape. He heard the ostler shout behind him and came into the road. She was up and dim already. He got into the saddle without a blunder. In a moment the ostler was in the gateway with a full-throated, "'Hi, sir! That ain't allowed!' and Hoopdriver was overtaking the young lady in grey. For some moments the earth seemed alive with shouts of, Stop em! and the shadows with ambuscades of police. The road swept round, and they were riding out of sight of the hotel, and behind dark hedges, side by side. 
She was weeping with excitement as he overtook her. Brave, she said, brave! And he ceased to feel like a hunted thief. He looked over his shoulder and about him, and saw that they were already out of Bognor, for the Vicuna stands at the very westernmost extremity of the seafront, and riding on a fair, wide road. End of Part 7